Hello, YouTube. I'm Kai Wright. Welcome to the United States of Anxiety. I'm the host of the show. Um, and, you know, we're streaming from WNYC Studios here live tonight. Thanks for joining us. We're going to start in a few minutes. Um, but um, for now, you're kind of backstage with uh, with me and the rest of the team. I'm going to introduce everybody in a minute. But, you know, I assume that a lot of you are probably joining, even maybe some of you might be joining from the street right now, but a lot of you are probably joining from uh, a day or a weekend of marching in the streets. It's LGBT Pride Weekend uh, here in New York. It's the culmination of Pride Month, and it's a month and a year in which, you know, I am really reminded of the purpose of this this event, which is to stand up and say, you know, I'm here. <laughs> I am gay. You cannot tell me what to do with my body. You cannot tell me what to do with my heart. And that is a more resonant uh, idea than we thought when we first planned this episode because of the Supreme Court's opinion overturning the right to an abortion. So we're going to talk about that tonight. Uh, I'm going to get into the details here in a minute. But first, let me just introduce everybody. Uh, I am here with Kusha Navadar. Kusha, you want to? Want to introduce yourself, tell people what you're thinking about? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Kusha. I'm a producer on the show. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us. I think what I'm most excited about for this episode is just creating a space for us to process what's happened in the past week and to get to hear from our guests and to hear from you. So if you have something that you'd like to ask or you have something on your mind, be sure to leave it in the chat. I see some people talking already. Cryptomeria, thanks for joining us. Very nice to have you here. Um, leave a question in the chat. We'll be talking throughout the show. Thanks a lot, Kai. So that's Kusha. We have over behind the glass is Matthew Mirando. He is our live engineer. He keeps us literally on the radio. So um, uh, thank you for that, Matthew. Uh, and you can't see the rest of us, but I'm going to shout everybody out. We've got Katie Steele, who is our intern. She's helping answer the phones. Hey, Katie. Hi, Kai. And we've got Karen Frillman. She is the director of the show. How you doing tonight, Karen? It's been a tough weekend. It's been tough, and I'm, I am happy to be gathered with our audience. It feels like a good place to be for me. That's right. And we've got Regina to here, who books our guests. She's booked the whole show tonight and is also going to be helping to answer the phone. Regina, how are you doing? I'm good. I hope I'm not as staticky as I think I am right now. <laughs> You're coming through loud and clear. Uh, so, like I said, tonight we're yeah. going to celebrate Pride. Um, we're going to do it in a way that is congruent with its original purposes. We're going to gather. We're going to dis- we're going to think about how we can protect our individual rights uh, that we hold dear, while at the same time uh, being able to stand in celebration of ourselves and our communities. Uh, and so who we got, we got, we're going to talk to Ellie Mistal, uh, and he is going to tell us what you can and cannot do to check the Supreme Court. He's uh, been telling people this for a long time, so maybe now it's ready time for people can hear him. Uh, and we're going to talk to Mara Jones, one of my oldest and dearest friends, who is also the creator of Translash Media, and uh, she is going to help us understand how pride connects to this moment. Uh, and so we are also going to talk to all of you. We want to hear... Uh, I think I said at this top, but what we really want to hear from you throughout the show is just, you know, if you feel like your rights, your own individual rights have been threatened, are in jeopardy right now, um, uh, what are you going to do about it? Tell us, tell us one thing. It could be a big thing. It could be a small thing. It could be whatever. One thing you're going to do about it, the idea here is to just just state our intentions for each other. So that's what we're going to be talking about. You can drop it in the comment uh, in the chat. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, all that good stuff. Uh, and we're going to get started in about 50 seconds here. So uh, pardon me. I'll be looking down because I'm going to be making radio. But enjoy the show uh, and, and, and we'll talk soon. someone we have on the phone from Huntsville, Alabama, 
Dr. Sinithia Williams is an abortion provider at the Alabama Women's Center. Alabama is one of 11 states that now either ban or severely restrict access to abortion. Dr. Williams, thanks for calling in. Thank you so much for having me. So, Dr. Williams, I, I visited the Alabama Women's Center a few years ago after the state passed one of the laws that the anti-abortion mm-hmm. advocates hoped would go to the Supreme Court. And listeners, you can find the story we made about the clinic in our podcast feed. But, Dr. Williams, one thing they'll hear is about the way providers there have been fighting for years, frankly, just to keep the doors open. And I, and, and just in this moment, with the immediate ban, what, what does that mean now for your patients who, who are already seeking care? What, what, what did this mean for you on Friday? Yeah, so um, we, you know, every decision day, we, know, we knew that this decision was going to be coming down at some point this month. And so we would get updated from our lawyers in terms of, you know, this particular day will be a decision day. Um, and unfortunately, on Friday, we didn't get the all clear like we previously had. Um, we certainly were anticipating um, a decision like this um, and so had kind of prepared on what our next steps would be. But I don't think that any of us expected it to be this past Friday. Um, so sort of practically what that meant is that we had to stop abortion services. Um, so we had people in in the clinic and some people were able to receive their abortion, um, but we had um, several people who um, had come in for their first day where they have to sign their 48 hour consent um, and several other people who had already signed their consent who were there for their actual procedure that day that we had to turn away. Um, we spoke to all of those folks individually um, and gave them resources um, in terms of what the best options were, um, what clinics were going to be the closest for them to be, a, excuse me, to be able to seek care. Um, and as you might expect, people were mixed in their responses, but very um, many visibly upset, um, a lot of crying, many people, you know, some people immediately knew that they were going to move on to the next clinic so that they could get services. We actually had one person who had already been referred to our clinic because she wouldn't be able to get services in one, in one of the states over and that was yeah. still providing. Because you were already um, a place that so, people were coming from, from states that didn't have, didn't have services. Yes, yes. We received, you know, patients from southern Alabama, you know, we're located in northern Alabama, but from southern Alabama, Tennessee, very frequently from Mississippi. And, you know, since COVID has been ongoing and with some of the SB8 um, restrictions in Texas, we have been seeing more and more patients from Texas and Louisiana as well. What, so what does this mean? And, and I should say, I, I'm aware that, you know, at this point, you know, you have to be careful what you say. Um, so I, I just want to acknowledge that. But what does this mean for you now? Like, what, what, what does this mean for you and your colleagues at the clinic? Yeah, so, I mean, in the immediate, we are not able to offer abortion services. Um, and I think one of the things that is particularly um, unique about our clinic especially for um, a clinic that's in the South, is we are, the two providers there are both comprehensive OBGYN, so obstetricians mm-hmm. and gynecologists. So we provide services for, you know, pregnant patients who are continuing their pregnancies, prenatal care. We actually attend births. We do gynecologic surgeries on reproductive organs. Um, and so, you know, this is not just about what happens at the abortion clinic, but certainly we know that abortion is a, a common part of reproductive health care in general. And so there are going to be people who we are seeing for prenatal care who will need services like this because they have complex medical diagnosis, because, you know, the fetus has um, complex like um, deformations or anomalies, those sorts of things, or otherwise sick. Um, and our hands are going to be tied by the state now. Um, and so, you know, trying to think about how are we going to care for those patients who you know, I think abortion is always um, a time important factor, right? Like, you know, if somebody needs an abortion, they need that abortion as soon as possible. But especially when someone is medically ill, it becomes time becomes even more of a factor. Um, and so trying to think about how we can get care for patients is kind of at the front of our minds. 
What is your message to the rest of the country? We're, one of the things we're doing in the show tonight is we just want to state some intentions about what we're going to do to create the, the, the country we want to be in, each of us as individuals. And, you know, what would you say you and your patients need? What, what would you tell people? Um, I think some of the things that are really important in this immediate time period is just being really intentional about the information that you're sharing, right? So especially in places where um, abortion is restrictive, there's so many other restrictions in terms of like, you know, access to reproductive health care, access to health insurance, those sorts of things. And so people are not easily able to find resources to to get the care that they need. Mm. And so making sure that the things that we're propagating online and all of that are actually evidence-based, that we're not spreading misinformation um, to really kind of uplift the fact that, you know, abortion is safe, period. Um, We are moving into a time um, that in some ways is similar to before Roe v. Wade was passed, but some of the imagery in terms of like, um, you know, coat hangers and those sorts of things, it's not necessarily something that Um, is reflective of the current status of abortion. You know, we have medication abortion. Those are things that patients will be able to access and hopefully safely be able to use them. But we also are in a different time because surveillance is so much higher. We're just connected at all times. And so really what people are most at risk of is criminalization. And it's something that we've already been seeing over the past few years and it's only going to increase. Um, So really making sure that people are keeping in mind like what the actual risks are um, and then keeping in mind that the the best thing that people can do right at this moment is to give money if they have it. Mm. Um, uh, there is the National Network of Abortion Funds where you can find local abortion funds um, who, you know, abortion funds have been doing this work for a really long time. They're familiar with the laws of your state. They're familiar with what patients actually need in a practical way. And so for folks to be able to actually get to the care that they need in terms of travel Mm. and hotels and actually coordinating the care in the clinics, um, they're going to be the best folks Mm. to do that. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. People have been preparing for this moment for a long time. For a long time. Thank you for calling in. Dr. Sunitha Williams is a care provider at this point at, at Alabama Williams Center and, and uh, excuse me, Alabama Women's Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Thank you for your work uh, and thanks for checking in, Dr. Williams. Thank you so much for having me. So it has been an epic past week in the history of this country's debate over just what kind of national community we want to be. It's not just abortion rights, it was also gun control and police accountability and an open threat to a whole other range of previously established individual rights, same-sex marriage, our private sexual relationships, access to contraception. And there's still more to come from the Supreme Court this term. And so I want to start talking about what, if anything, can be done to balance the power of a Supreme Court that is issuing opinions that are far out of step with the majority of Americans' opinions. I am joined for that conversation by Ellie Mistal, to whom we often turn when the court is wilding out. Uh, He is the justice correspondent for The Nation magazine and author of Allow Me to Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Supreme Court. Ellie, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me, Kai. How are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. So, frankly, what is to be done? Uh, On Friday, you wrote in your column in response to the ruling Uh, that everyone who does not want to live in the country that this Supreme Court is building needs to first and foremost let go of any notion that, quote, normal, good government, institutionalist solutions are going to hold up. Um, So let's talk about what will hold up. Uh, The the Supreme Court itself, I just want to start with this notion, is that the Supreme Court itself is not above rebuke by the other branches of of, of, of the federal government. I mean, can you just explain that simple fact? Yeah, so in Federalist, I will go back to Federalist 78, where Alexander Hamilton, while explaining the structure of the government that he had just helped write into existence, he said that the Supreme Court would be the least dangerous branch of government because it contained neither the purse nor the sword. That meant that it neither has the ability to tax people, nor does it have the control of the army. 
the next time Alexander Hamilton would be as wrong, he was shooting his gun into the air while Aaron Burr killed him. All right. So that he was just straight up wrong about that. The Supreme Court is extremely powerful because we allow it to be. This Mm. idea that the Supreme Court can overturn acts of Congress is a power that the Supreme Court gave itself in 1803. At some point, the other two branches of government, especially the executive branch of government, needs to check the power of this unelected, unaccountable body and start returning us to something approaching a democratic republic. So there are various things that the Biden administration can do right now today, and in fact, should have been doing since September when Texas went rogue and canceled the constitutional rights of women and returned them to second class status. There are things that the federal government- What are some of those things? What are some of those things? Let's be specific here. Okay, so right now, what should happen is that Biden should federalize abortion, should provide for abortion services on federal lands. I'm talking about military installations. I'm talking about any property that the federal government owns, any land. You could do it at a national park if you had to. The way that this would get around the Hyde Amendment, which is something that we can talk about later, the idea that you can't use federal money to fund abortions, is that you simply lease the land to the abortion providers. You lease the land to Dr. Williams, ask her to pay for it out of pocket. I bet she could raise some money to pay for those services. I know I'd be willing to give. Start a GoFundMe. We'll figure it out, right? So lease the land to Dr. Williams so she can keep doing her work. That's number one. Number two, the the... <laughs> Uh, the, the 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 abortion medication that she was just talking about, that's uh-huh. going to be outlawed in various states. So you should be able to pick it up at the post office. Turn your post offices into CVS. Anything federal you... becomes like an outlet for care, basically. 100%, right? Um, the other the other thing that we can do, and again, uh, Dr. Williams was talking about this just now, um, women are going, women and pregnant people are going to need the ability to travel from states that treat them as second class citizens to states in the rest of America. That travel should be provided for the federal government. You don't have to call it travel for abortion. You can call it travel for vacations. You can say, hey, every expectant mother now gets a free vacation to New York or California. I'd love to see New York or California, wouldn't you? And and that's how you do it. So you, se- you send them buses and planes and vouchers so they can go to where the services are still provided. As, as a side point to that, one of the most obvious things that needs to happen right now is that Biden needs to make sure that transfers are available to federal prisoners. Because right now, if you are raped and impregnated in prison in a state that does not allow for abortion, they are going to force you to carry that baby to term. So Biden can right now take that off the table by allowing for transfers to states that still provide services. I'm going to interrupt you. We're going to come back with more of these details. We need to take a break. Uh, I am talking with Ellie Mistal, author of Allow Me to Retort, a Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution and Justice Correspondent for The Nation magazine. And when we return, listeners, I want to bring you into this conversation, too. We're talking about the Supreme Court now, but we're going to go on to talk about LGBT issues shortly. And in general, my question tonight is this. If you're feeling your own rights taken away or put in jeopardy right now in some way, what is one thing you're going to do about it? It can be big. It can be small. It's not the point. It's just sharing our intentions, naming our intentions. That is the spirit of pride for me. So 212-433-WNYC. That's 212-433-9692. Or drop a comment in the chats if you're watching on YouTube. We'll take a break and we'll be right back. Stay with us. On the next All of It, it's our June Get Lit with All of It book club live radio event with Chantal V. Johnson as we discuss her debut novel, Post Traumatic. Plus, Ronan Farrow and Patricia Campos join me to discuss their documentary.
Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright, and I'm still bo- still joined by Ellie Mistel, the justice correspondent for The Nation and author of Allow Me to Retort, a black guy's guide to the Constitution. Uh, your calls and comments are coming in. I'm, I'm asking, for, I'm, we're going to talk to Ellie about the Supreme Court here for a few more minutes and how you can check the power of the Supreme Court. We're going to, in a minute, turn to LGBT issues and just talk about the spirit of pride. And in the course of that, I want to know, just for all of you out there, what if if you feel like one of you, a right that is important to you is in jeopardy right now is being taken away, what are you going to do about it? What is one step you're going to take, big or small? It doesn't matter. Uh, we're just trying to share our intentions now. That is the spirit of pride for me. Uh, is this is this notion that I stand in public and I say I am here, I am gay, and you are not going to make me go away. Um, so. How, let, let's share that on the range of rights issues today. Uh, 212-433-WNYC. That's 212-433-9692. Drop a comment in the chat if you're on YouTube. Um, Ellie, one question we have gotten on Twitter uh, uh, about checking the power of the Supreme Court is about Congress and what Congress can do. Um, and so on the question of abortion in particular, um, is there... Um, you know, is and an a federal abortion access law entirely out of the question now? Um, and if they did pass it, couldn't the court just I'm adding this part, couldn't the court just overturn that? Yeah. So if you notice in my first segment, I start I stayed with executive power because the executive controls the army. So when SCOTUS says, like, oh no, you can't do that, Biden can say, Yeah, okay, good luck trying to stop me, right? I mean, whoa, Congress but that's a, a lot. I mean, so really genuinely, like that's the level we have to think about it on. Yes, that's how Republicans think. At some point, Democrats are going to have to start thinking the same way, right? Um, Congress is a trickier beast because con- if Congress passes a law federalizing abortion, federalizing abortion protection, what makes anybody think that the six theocrats that just thumb their nose at 50 years of their own precedent would not just thumb their nose at Congress. If Congress passes abortion an abortion law, I promise you the, the six justices on the Supreme Court will strike it down as an un, as an unconstitutional use of the Commerce Clause uh, power before breakfast. So if you want, now look, I'm not saying the Congress shouldn't pass the law. Congress should pass the law. But in order to secure the law, the only thing to do, the only check on Supreme Court power, the only constitutional check on Supreme Court power is expanding the number of justices on on the Supreme Court to drown out the voices of the six theocrats that we currently have. That's in the Constitution. Article 3 leaves it up to Congress to figure out how many justices should be on the Supreme Court. When the country was founded, we had six. It went up to seven. Lincoln put it up to 10. Do you know why Lincoln put it up to 10? Because wow. during the Civil War, Chief Justice Roger Taney and a conservative majority on the t- on the court were telling Lincoln he couldn't use executive power. Lincoln ignored him and then added a 10th seat to the Supreme Court to shut him up. All right. So the, the idea that the number of justices can be changed has been done throughout American history and has been done specifically in American history to check a court that was completely out of step of where the popularly elected uh, uh, leaders were. So if you actually want to codify um, the federal abortion law, to say nothing of codifying all of the other rights that we haven't even gotten to that the court is planning on taking away, the only actual solution is to expand the Supreme Court and fill it with justices who believe in pluralistic democracy you, as opposed to theocracy. You have been saying this for some time, Ellie. Indeed. Um, and <laughs> um, do you, have you sensed any shift um, in, I mean, in people, uh, you know, the, 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 people who very much share your politics have said, I think that's a bad idea. Um, yeah. Have you sensed any shift um, in the appetite for such a thing and as we have seen this this court start to act in this term from people on the ground absolutely from activists in the community absolutely from leaders eh, right um mondaire jones who currently is in a tough primary and in, in lower manhattan and park slope um after his district got gerrymandered away uh, um he is one of the only congress people who is out front for court expansion. Most of the other ones, and certainly most of the senators, have been very uh, circumspect about it. And obviously, um, Joe Biden is dead set against it. So that's a huge problem. But if you talk to people on the ground, they're starting to understand that the Supreme Court is, it's, it's un- 
livable with the way it is right now, right? Like if you don't expand the court, what you're saying is that you are going to gift conservative control over our laws. You're gonna gift conservatives a veto over any law for the next 30 to 40 years. So I say we expand the court. People say, oh, well, if you expand the court, won't Republicans just expand it right back? Yeah, so. A, if you expand the court with liberal justices, the ch uh, they will secure voting rights, and then the chances that Republicans can take back all of government to re-expand it after you secure voting rights, that's a lot harder. But B, even if I'm wrong, and the Republicans do take back the House, the Senate, and the White House, and re-expand it, let's say I added 10 justices, so it's 13-6. Then Republicans can come back in and add 10 justices, and it's 16-13. How is that worse than where we are now? I, so I, at least if all I've done is given women another, I don't know, five years of yeah. controlling their own bodies, then I will put that on my headstone as good work for the day. OK, the the I, I'm, I'm going to stop you so we can get to some calls, Ellie. But we, I, Ellie Mistal continues to make this case. Expand the court. You've heard it. OK, let's go to Tim in Brooklyn. Tim, welcome to the show. Hi, Kai. Hi, Kai. Hi, Kai. Hi Ellie. Um, Hi. We don't need to expand the court. We don't need to pass a new law. The right for a woman to control her own body needs to be recontextualized, re reestablished as a basic right to self-protection. And therefore, it does not depend on the right to privacy. It does not depend on the 14th Amendment. It does not depend on the First Amendment. It's based in millennia of common law. Tim, let the me right ask you this, though. Let me, let, let, me, let me ask you this, Tim, because this is the question I've got for people tonight is, Name one intention for yourself. If that's what you believe, that's what you want to see happen. What's one thing, big or small, that you feel like, this is what I'm now going to be doing. This is what I'm going to do to make this come to true. I'm going to be uh, put, putting out this theory of the self-defense doctrine. And I think it's fun, a fundamental shift in, in our, our thinking and our defense of a woman's right okay. to protect her own body. Because this used to be called the common, the, 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 the reasonable man standard. So let's apply the reasonable man standard. Ask any reasonable man, would he gestate a nine pound parasite and expel it through his pelvis? And would he consider that? I'm going to leave it there, Tim. I, I think I got it. I just want to try to get as many callers as possible. Let's go to Tulis in Harlem. Tulis, welcome to the oh. show. Oh, my gosh. Thank you. I adore this show. Thank you uh, for taking my call. So I'm a, I'm a heterosexual woman. I live up in Harlem. And listening to, is it Eli? Ellie Mistal. Ellie, sorry. I learned more in the past 10 minutes. <laughs> I, 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 I'm gobsmacked. So what I'm going to do is I want to get a, I can, I'm going to let my representatives know that this guy is still great. I didn't even know things could be codified. So you're going to, you're going to fight for the codification. You're going to fight for the codification of uh, the 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 right to abortion. That's 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 what you're going to do to us. Absolutely, and I'm going to use this this uh, interview to send to my representatives. <laughs> okay. I just think it's friggin' brilliant. Thank you for that, Tulis. We we enjoy your calls. Thanks for calling us up. I, so, Ellie, I, I I'm going to wrap up because we're going to get to we've got to get to pride issues as well here. Um, but I want to ask you the same question I'm asking listeners. I could, you know, you're, you're, you're making these arguments. It's great. We hear it. You know, um, you're out there, you're out, out there beating the drum for expand the court. What, what model for model for our listeners, for yourself, what's one thing if you, to, to make that thing, that come true, what's one intention you, you want to state? Yeah. Well, you, you've got to call. My father was a local politician. And I used to joke that if I wanted Tim to to do like to change my allowance, I need to call his office and get like 10 more people to call his office because that's the phone that he always answered, right? Like you have to make your representatives know what you want because as I said, the idea these ideas are out there and there are people on the ground who believe in them, but the leaders that we have right now are, are from my perspective letting us down they're not taking the full measure of executive power they're not doing everything they can and when you look at what the when you look at how republicans play when you look at what the supreme court is going to do you're about to talk about pride issues it's very clear that the next thing that that's they're right. going for are lgbtq rights they have said so that's next on the block so when you look at Republicans using maximal power, I'm trying to call my representatives. I'm trying to get people to understand what maximal power looks like to defeat them. 
Ali Mistel is the justice correspondent for the nation and author of Allow Me to Re- Retort, A Black Guy's Guide to the Constitution, uh, bringing the fire and brimstone, as always. Thank you, Ali. Thanks for having me, Kai. So pivoting slightly, but this, as Ellie has just pointed out, this, this is part of, this is all, all of a piece. And I, and I want to start with by saying I had a useful experience this morning. I, I wasn't in New York City this weekend, so I had to take the train back into town. And when I got on, it was just packed to the rafters with this wonderful melange of people decked out in rainbows and hearts and glitter and just all the fashions of Pride Day. And there were a range of gender identities and of body types and skin tones and accents. And they were painting each other's faces and doing each other's hair. And there was this little girl who was asking her mom and dad whether like, they were going to see a friend that I guess they see every pride. And I just thought, this, this is beautiful. This is, this is the reality that we built. But the freedom on that train, it just, it didn't just come to be. Generations of LGBT people and our allies work to make it so. And so I'm thinking what's to be learned from that experience and that history about how to protect our freedoms, about how to expand them, and about how we can all enter the necessary fights and struggles ahead over all of that without also allowing those fights to steal our joy and define us in them. And I have been having conversations about this in versions, in one version or another, with my next guest for my whole adult life. Amara Jones is the creator of Translash Media and host of the Translash podcast, where she talks with trans people and allies about how we can create a more fair world for everybody. And she happens to be, as I said, one of my dearest friends. Happy Pride, Amara. Happy Pride, Kai. This is quite a change for us. It is quite. Well, let's start there um, with our own Pride to traditions. I mean, most years, right about now, we would be deep into running the streets, uh, probably about to board a boat and dance the sundown over the East River. Um, you have always been our fearless leader in that. Uh, what has that meant to you personally, not politically? Just what, what has, has Pride and those traditions for us meant to you over the years? I mean, it's just so deeply affirming. Um, it's so deeply affirming in every single way. I was thinking about this the other day, but I think that the first time that I wore uh, a dress in public was at a was at New York Pride. Mm. I think it was in two thousand or two thousand and one. And so, like, um, I was thinking about that the other day, and how the response from people. Um, is something that I still remember. So yeah, I mean, normally today is a massive community day. Um, It is when community from all over the world and all over the country um, come together. And I mean, like our immediate community. Um, And usually we do nothing the whole weekend (laughs) and especially the entire day, but take up space. That's right. And take up space, with who we are and we take up space unapologetically and we are engaged with other people who also similarly are taking up space and that freedom, that oxygen that people get from this event is powerful and necessary. And it's why pride continues to sustain itself, you know, through all of the ups and downs and the bumps and bruises. Um, even through the last three years um, with all the controversies that it's had, it's still there and still powerful and still calls people. And it's for that reason. I think that, you know, there's no way that you can gather with some number of hundreds of thousands of people. It's it ranges anywhere from a half a million. I think um, the 50th anniversary of Stonewall was a million. There's no way that you can gather with that many people and feel like you don't matter yeah, and yeah. feel like you are insignificant and feel like, um, you know, so many things that, that we've all grown up with at various stages of our lives of people telling us that we don't matter or that we're not real. There's no way that you can look around and be in that, mm-hmm. that experience and believe that any of that is true, which is why it remains, you know, a powerful, powerful draw. And one of the ways that we know that pride still is deeply relevant and matters is the number of um, young people that go. And I'm talking people who are 18, 19, 20, 21. It's their first pride. Um, and younger. And younger. Yeah. 
Yeah, and younger. Um, and so there's something that even in this age where people are like, oh, well, young people grow up with so many this, that, and the third, and so many, you know, role models and all the rest of it, there's something still um, deeply needed and relevant to connect with other people in person on a massive scale to validate who we are. Yeah. And how are you feeling this year? It's it's more complicated. We've talked about this uh, privately, but you know, I, mm -hmm. I have found it harder to claim the joy and the celebration that you're describing, mm -hmm. um, and that yeah. concerns me about myself. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I I never want to be trapped in defining my experience as a struggle and a fight, um, mm -hmm. and and it feels hard this year. How how are you doing on that? I mean, well, for me, this is the third year that in some way Pride is impacted by COVID. I mean, this year, as we said, we are, I'm doing it. I now, you know, for the first time contracted COVID um, and I'm luckily recovering. Um, just a word to the wise that anyone who said that it's a light disease lied. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that the thing for me that's really deeply important is how, um, I feel like I feel ambivalent about it this year, um, and I, I can't I can't shake that. Um, you know, there's a part of me that wants to be outside, and there's a part of me that doesn't want to be outside, mm -hmm. and I feel that deeply in myself this year. Um, I think it's a combination of lots of different things. I think it is me still very much being aware of the fact that. Um, you know, a million people have died and we haven't found a way to mark that in a way that I think actually honors the experience that we've all been through. Um, I think that that um, it is really important for us to get together and to come together, but I think that a large part of the drive has been for because of corporate interest. Um, and that is a thing that makes me sad aside from everything that I just said. And then I also, excuse me, I also think that, um, I also think that you know, this year, a lot of people showing up at Pride, it was important symbolically, but it was also symbolic. And we need more than that, kind of what um, Ellie was saying before. And then I think lastly, my ambivalence is the fact that, you know, um, I wasn't, for the first time ever, I wasn't sure that Pride was gonna be safe. Yeah. Amara, let me um, let me interrupt you. We're gonna come back to that. I need to take a short break. Yeah. I'm talking with Amara Jones, host of the Translash podcast, where she talks with trans people and allies about how we can create a more fair world for all of us. Stay with us. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright, and I'm with Amara Jones, host of the Translash podcast. Uh, we are talking about the week we have had, really the year we have had, uh, that is culminating in LGBT Pride this weekend, and it's making that a complicated thing for both me and Amara. Uh, listeners, you can join the conversation 
I, I want to hear what I want to hear your intentions. I want to hear if you are feeling on your back foot right now, if you are feeling like, you know, my rights are being taken away, they are in jeopardy, either because of the Supreme Court ruling on abortion or because of the coming rulings uh, that people fear on LGBT issues in particular, uh, give us a call. What are you going to do about it? I want to know one thing that you're going to do, one intention, one intention, big, small, it doesn't matter. Maybe it's just you're going to hug a bunch of people this, in the next week. Uh, whatever it is, I just want you to bring that into this space. 212-433-WNYC. That's 212-433-9692. If you're joining us on YouTube, drop uh, your answer in the chat. And Amar, you were, you were, you, when we went to break, you were talking about safety um, and that one of the reasons that you felt ambivalent this year um, is, is safety in general. And I just want to prompt you, you said something to me once about, um, you know, safety is something that we all create together, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, and I wonder if you can just unpack that here in this moment. And I'm really, and I'm particularly thinking about sort of not just our physical safety, but our political safety. Yes, um, conscious of time, I will try to do so really briefly. I mean, I think that I think that um, that one of the things that's really fascinating is how we have a concept that public safety is something that is um, imposed upon us, that it is police reliant. But as you move throughout your day, um, if you you know, depending on what neighborhood you're in, and but most people. Um, don't may not lay eyes on a police officer or may do so in passing, which means that the safety is something that we create. Safety isn't imposed upon us by, by an authority. Um, we have a misconception of what is actually keeping us safe. What keeps us safe are um, how strong our communities are, how well we look after each other, how well we are personally. There's an entire sort of lattice work of safety. And I think that, you know, it's what actually made pride feel safe for the longest time is that we realized that we overwhelmingly had each other. And we noticed that mm -hmm. particularly during the Bloomberg era, there began to be a greater police presence at pride. And in many ways that actually created less safety, um, particularly for the most vulnerable LGBTQ people towards the end of pride, we'll actually see what happens tonight. And I think that one, that's one of the things that we have done is that we create safety for each other um, overwhelmingly. I think there is a different, slightly different um, thing at work where we realize that there are these people who um, are armed like those in the military um, who have been cultivated in quiet places on the internet who are selectively being activated. Um, and that creates an entire different layer of concern. But I think that we create safety for each other. And I think that it's also the fact that I think that that's where ultimately the solutions to everything that we're facing are going to come from. They're not going to come from politicians because whatever politicians are in the system right now have been schooled in a certain way of thinking about what is acceptable. And I think that we're living in a time when whatever we thought was acceptable before is out the window, which means that there has to be new thought around how we create political safety in a broader sense, along sort of the ideas that we were talking about before. So that means we have to become more and more reliant um, uh, upon each other. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think that as we know, there's no consequence free action in American politics. And so I'm, I don't think that this is going to go how the Republicans think it's going to go. The, the, the Supreme Court ruling. Uh, I mean, and I also think I also think that the ability to be able to I mean, for them now, the sky's the limit. Right. So they think that it's just an inexorable ride to the top of the maximalist vision of their erasing space for anyone who they don't want to be included. And it's not going to happen like that. I, one of our YouTube viewers uh, mentions the sort of ac lack of access to equal information. Um, and, uh, and, I, and, and, you know, they were talking about some of the stuff that Ellie was saying, but I think that's also true for, for um, a whole host of things and particularly thinking about um, access to equal information about our lives as queer people and about the lives of trans folks in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. How, just respond to that a little bit for me in terms of the idea of equal information and what it means for our ability to protect our rights. Well, I mean, I think that the, my, I don't, the, the quote, 
lack of equal access of information, close quote, is not an accident. I mean, the fact is that there is an entire misinformation effort on the internet in many ways stoked by the same um, institutions and people that are behind the mainstream funding of our rights. They have an entirely separate sort of operation online as we spent a lot of time digging into. And there's an entire pipeline of people who um, create misinformation on 4chan, who are then um, funneled up into certain chat rooms that are then echoed by the right wing um, echo chamber and then funneled to the mouths of politicians. So for example, right after Uvalde within 24 hours, um, the rumor on 4chan of uh, the shooter being a trans person went from being on 4chan um, to out of the mouth of a GOP politician. And that pipeline, there's nothing artificial about it. There's an entire misinformation effort. And I think that we have to get away from this idea that somehow we are naturally divided or somehow there's a misunderstanding or, you know, gee whiz, there are just these forces out there and we don't understand each other. We have to understand that, you know, there are, there are dark forces at work in our country that have been here for a long time that have brought us to this place. To there's no accident. One another. It wasn't accidentally. Well, and, well, yeah, and 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 to actually um, and to weaponizing the misunderstanding. One of the things that I think is interesting, though, just in the and if you'll bear with me on this, as I try to tease it out, you know, because when I mm -hmm. think about your reporting on what has happened at the state level on a, the, you know with this machine that you're describing, uh, trying to target trans youth um, uh, and make them a political football, and just mm -hmm. the the ways in which. Um, in the positive version of the access to information, the ways in which um, there's that folks who um, you have met and interviewed have said, oh, wow, wait a minute. I, for the first time in the course of this politics, have been I have been introduced to the trans community um, and I have discovered this incredible movement that is on the rise and that is like that is the winning team, so to speak, um, and that they didn't even know about it. And. and I wonder about that too, like not just the 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 misinformation about each other, but the sort of obscuring of the good news. Yeah, uh, you know, because <clears throat> excuse me, I think that um, the <clears throat> obscuring of the good news is also a part of the a part of the like I think about the way in which, for example, this misinformation that we're talking about has come to shape the debate in mainstream newsrooms, like terrible articles, for example example that have come out from the New York Times um, recently about about trans people and about a whole host of other things. Um, whereas, you know, as I constantly tell people, one of the biggest um, underreported stories I think of our time is just the the breath and the power and the visioning that Black trans women are doing across a whole host of areas, um, for example. And so again, I just don't think, I don't think that it's an accident. I think that there is a combination between these institutions that are at work in our society and also combining with the way that white supremacy works to value who's heard and who's important and who we think we should write about. And those two things work on each other to erase um, and to obscure. Um, and I think that, um, you know, that's part of the problem. I mean, we need a, a total revolution, um, you know, in the Jill Scott Heron idea, revolution of thought in terms of how, who we perceive matters and how our institutions work. Yeah. And, and I guess to come at it another way too, what I'm asking there, I mean, can you, how would you describe the state of the movement for gender freedom today? Because it feels to me, you know, we have um, <clears throat> both been in around um, LGBT politics for a long time, and it feels mm. to me um, like we are in a unique moment and have been for a couple of years um, where um, the trans community has really taken leadership. Um, well, I think we're just at the beginning of this fight, and I think it's because it's related very much to what we what you've been talking about all hour, which is that you know the next front in this war for the abortion rights movement are, are trans rights. Um, they pretty much made that explicit. They've already begun to migrate the same tactics that they used. Um, in fighting the abortion rights movement to, um, to trans rights. So for example, they started just this year beginning to target trans doctors, for example, um, with the exact same tactics that they used in, in a 
of worst rights. And what the right does is that it road tests ideas. And so it's going to see how successful they are in getting people to back down. They've already forced you know, um, a, a clinic in, um, or an entire medical practice as a part of a university system in Texas to shut down. So I think we're gonna see more of this, you know, the labeling of, of trans people as pedophiles and the way in which <clears throat> they then turn their guns on the people that they label pedophiles as we, we've seen throughout recent history. So I think that we're just at the beginning. Corresponding to that though is both the, 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 the necessary response is, as we say, the creation of a lot of trans leadership. And I think that the reason why trans leadership is so needed right now is because it was created outside of the traditional strictures, which means that it is more in line with the radical vision that needs to be made to respond to the moment than anything else. You know, it's the, it is the solution because um, everything else has been, um, has been uh, has been uh, co-opted as a part of the system into you know people think, thinking they're protecting something that's already gone. Mm. You know, I think that and trans people, <clears throat> excuse me, recognize quite clearly that it's gone. You know, in many ways, it was never there. What right. you were doing was shadow boxing with the idea of safety, the idea that you had these rights, but these rights were not in practice for everyone, which is why they were tenuous, and that's why there's been a lot of visioning. Um, on, in trans leadership and why I think trans vision and trans leadership is so important. And, and I think we'll be turned to more and more. Yeah. That's, that's, it's a very interesting point, you know, uh, that, you know, it, that folks who are not invested in the institutions in the first instance are able to see that they cannot save us. Um, let's go to mm -hmm. James in Westfield, New Jersey. James, welcome to the show. Hey, how you doing? Thank you for having me. Thanks for calling in. Do, do you have an intention uh, for how you how you're going to contribute to try to protect any rights that you feel are are, are slipping away for you? I, I do. You know, I, I, what I plan to do is to take to Instagram and, and Facebook and, and various social medias and to really just, you know, I think one of the big problems that we have is everything becomes such a polarized issue. But what I think we what we really have here is a situation where the right is decimating everybody's rights you know i support everybody i, I see no reason for 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 me or anybody else to be persecuting or harming any group so um but but uh, you know I, as a straight white man 65 years old with tremendous privilege in America, you know, white privilege, you know, it's easy sometimes to think like, well, we're immune to all this, these problems, but we're seeing that we're not. Mm. I mean, the, the right is going and just taking out, you know, fundamental rights of, of people. And um, we're all vulnerable to that. And and that's not the reason why we should be doing this. We should be doing that to protect everybody anyway. But I, there's this where everybody's misguided. I have a I have a cousin a little I, bit older than me. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna really quick. just for time, though, James. I'm gonna if you can say it really fast. Okay, I have a cousin, conservative, votes conservative across the block, is outraged at, at what's going on right now with Roe v. Wade. Hmm. Wake up. This is what's going to happen. You know, if anybody that thinks Trump and all these people are, are, are working in their interests are sadly mistaken. Thank you for that, James. So, Amara, this is that I think connects a little bit to what you were saying is that, um, you know, th this can go too far. This being sort of the attack on rights can go too far, um, even for uh, the conservative movement. And, um, you know, that the that no one is going to be the, the notion that you that whatever identity you've got wherever you sit that this is not going to come for you eventually uh is misguided yeah i mean i think that for me like i really do think you know i think a lot about u.s history because these battles for rights take place over a giant canvas of time and you know i really think that this is akin to uh the fugitive slave acts i really do think where is the I radicalizing movement 
Um, I really think it was a radicalizing moment where people thought, oh, this thing that I thought was over there and was never going to touch me and wasn't going to bother me. And that, you know, they're always talking about, but in my day to day life, I'm able to be okay when you're, they're like, oh, no, the state can force me to do things that I individually cannot resist. That is to say, the state can deputize me and say that I am a deputy of a deputy U.S. Marshal, and that I have to go capture slaves, even though I may be abolitionist, even though this may be against my beliefs, was a radicalizing moment. And I think that this is that, and this is why, you know, there never, any time there's a move like this in American history, it's never cost-free. As we wrap up, I, I want to try to bring us back around to just the celebration of this, you know, because mm-hmm. well, as I said, the uh, one of the things I've struggled with is how to hold both. Um, mm-hmm. And that is something I think you are uniquely good at in my life. Um, can can you talk, just leave people with this thought about like how you manage to face all this reality that you're describing, um, but also continue to celebrate ourselves? Because today is fun. <laughs> like, I mean, like, even with everything that's there, like when I am looking out um, through my timeline and turning on television and seeing streaming and that sort of thing, it's fun. It's still <laughs> fun. And the reason why is because there's just a part of us. And I mean, we know this is any people who come from oppressed people, this is just the case, whether or not you're African-American or Puerto Rican or like, there are a lot of different people, oppressed people is that like, you, there's a something that we learn or that is brought forth in humanity. There's just a part of us that isn't contingent upon what other people think of us. And that like, we're still, still able to relish that about ourselves and relish that about each other. And so that's going to continue regardless. Um, you know, they're not going to steal all the hope in the world. That's just not going to happen. Um, we, and um, that's just impossible. And um, we, today is still fun. Today and we're is still fun. fun. We will have to leave it there. Amara Jones is the creator of Translast Media and host of Translast Podcast. She joins us even as she gets over COVID. So thank you so much, Amara. And I hope you feel better soon. The United States of Anxiety is a production of WNYC Studios. You can follow us wherever you get your podcasts at WNYC.org slash anxiety or by emailing us at anxiety at WNYC.org. Do send me those those statements of intention. What are you going to do to protect yourself? I'm Kai Wright. Thanks for spending this time with us. Talk to you next week.